chapter number 8, and then I'm going to end in Romans chapter number 8 uh, this evening. One of the uh, uh, topics or the themes that I've been preaching on, especially in Wednesday evening sermons, and a couple of times in the morning sermons as well, is I've been preaching about trials and tribulations and persecutions and hard times. Us as a church have went through some of those recently. Uh, individuals have went, went through some of those recently, personal uh, uh, problems, and all different types of things. And I have, in, from different angles and perspectives, I've been talking about this for quite a while. And uh, there's another topic, a little facet of this, that I wanted to point out. Uh, this evening on the subject of, of trials and tribulations and to preach a sermon that would be an encouragement to you this evening. Now, what we oftentimes do when we go through trials or when we go through tribulations, number one, we think, well, I must be doing something wrong or I must be doing something bad. Now, that's not always a bad thing to do. It is good to have a humble heart and to ask the question as the apostles did that were seated with Jesus Christ at the Last Supper, Lord, is it I? That's good to start off with. Lord, is it I? But let me tell you this, that that also can come from the wrong mindset of asking the question, am I doing something wrong in this sense? Today there is a false Christianity that's preached from pulpits uh, uh, Joel Osteen, he's really the, the picture boy, or the poster boy of this particular type of prosperity gospel. And that is that if you are a Christian, your life will be you know, uh, perfect from beginning to end. You know, if you are a Christian, you will never face any trials or tribulation when the Bible actually teaches the exact opposite. The Bible actually teaches that as a Christian, your life will be harder. As a Christian, you should expect to go through hard times, tribulations, persecutions, trouble, and trials. You should expect that. So, yes, it's good to assume, hey, I could be the one that's at, you know, at fault here. I could be wrong. Maybe I, It's good to examine yourselves. The Bible teaches that. But you shouldn't go so far as to think that if I am, being, you know, uh, if I am having problems or if I am having trouble in my life, well, then that means I'm not in God's will. That is not a correct approach to what the Bible teaches about the Christian life. The Christian life is filled with problems and trials and tribulations. And oftentimes what we do is we fail to see the big picture. That's the title of the sermon this, more, or this evening. Uh, fail, it's, it's the, we fail to see the big, the big picture. And the title of the sermon is this. Seeing the big picture. Seeing the big picture. I want to begin with verse number 28. Romans chapter number... 8, verse number 28, the Bible says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. So I want you to notice that it tells you that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now, that verse is found in Romans chapter number 8, and is used in summary after he just got done discussing sufferings and trials and tribulations that we go through. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, but I want you to look with me at verse number 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but, reason of, but by reason of hope uh, of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the fr first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. So you're talking about groanings, talking about infirmities. We didn't read it, but verse number 18 mentions the word exactly, sufferings. But he keeps going on there in verse 26. For we know that we should pray for, for we, for we know not what we should pray for. As we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Then we have verse number 28. He then goes on to, to talk about you know, the foreknowledge and the predestination and the plan of God and how all of that works out. Then he goes on and he says in verse number 31, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Notice he's trying to encourage the church at Rome. 
He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. Who is, he, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? So sufferings, groaning, tribulation, trials, he's talking about infirmities. Then again, we see it one more time, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? What is the point of this whole entire passage? I don't know if you've noticed that before, but it's talking about the trials and the troubles of life. It's talking about looking forward to the day of the redemption, looking forward to the day of, our salva of the salvation of our bodies, and going to heaven, and, and how great that, that day will be. Why? Because of all the problems and the trials and the tribulations that we go through as Christians. Now that verse is found there for a reason. Because it tells you we know that all things work together for good. Now it's always exposited correctly, but I've never heard it pointed out that that's actually what it's teaching in context. He's talking about the redemption of our body. He's talking about one day we will be redeemed. But until then, we are going to groan. We're going to have infirmities. We're going to have sufferings. We're going to have problems. We're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulation. And then that's why he finishes with, Who shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, you know, and then he goes on, peril, the sword. He goes to a big list of what? Problems. So I want you to notice that. I want to begin with that. We know that all things work together for good. So the end goal, you know, the end result of the Christian life is good and it works together for good. But does that mean that it's going to be perfect along the way? You know, sometimes we need, to, we need to be able to look at and see the big picture. I want you to go to the Old Testament. Now, there are a lot of Old Testament saints, for specifically 1 Samuel 17. There are a lot of Old Testament saints that we look up to. We've been talking about this, you know, uh, some of the guys have been talking about this in conversation. Um... There are a lot of the guys, a lot of the, the men of the Old Testament that we look up to and that we admire. And I mentioned this also in last week's uh, Bible study Wednesday night about how sometimes we hold, you know, the saints of the Old Testament to like this special sainthood. Like Moses and all of these men, as if they're no longer a man. And we look at their lives and we don't understand that they live the same type of life that we lived. That they have the same flesh, the same DNA, they had parents, nothing's different. And the only reason why they were capable of doing the great things that we look up to them for was because they had a great God that they were serving. That's what enabled them to be able to do that. It had nothing to do intrinsically with them. But we'll look at their lives and, and many times those of the Old Testament who are the, the, the really the big you know, uh, 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 players in the Old Testament will look at their lives and we think that their lives were just filled with blessings from beginning to end. Even though the Bible records a lot of suffering. When you think of these characters, oftentimes you just think of the positive. Now, if I mention King David, if I mention David, you know, most people are going to think of David and Goliath. Most people are going to think of all of the accomplishments that David, uh, uh, you know, uh, all of the feats that David accomplished, right? All of these different things that David did in his life. You know, how he was a successful warrior, you know, he was exalted, you know, uh, uh, in, into the position of being the captain of the guard. He became king and reigned for 40 years. And they think of David as if his entire life was glorious. And they think of David as if his, as if his entire life was just blessings from God. It was constant peace. It was constant blessings. And just, it was all positive and no negative. But what I want to do tonight is I want to go over the timeline of David's life. I want to give you a timeline because I want to put this into perspective and this is, ties in with the title of the sermon, Seeing the Big Picture. I want you to understand that a lot of your life, a lot of your life is going to be filled with trials and tribulations and problems and troubles. And you need to be warned about this. You need to understand this and know this. And we need to know that when these trials and tribulations come, we shouldn't be questioning why is this happening to me in the sense that it shouldn't be, I must not be in God's will. But rather, this is the life of a Christian. And even those that we think of that were blessed greatly, their, almost their entire life, if we look at the big picture, 
Almost their entire life was trials and tribulations and persecutions. So go to 1 Samuel chapter number 16. I want to begin with the very beginning of David's life because that's what I said. This is when he, he's mentioned actually for the first time is in 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to be walking through this and not a lot of narr uh, narration on my part or commentary I guess you'd say. Commentary on my part uh, is, is going to take place. But I want to go through his life and I want you to see all the problems and the trials and the tribulations that King David Probably one of the least expected people in the Bible that King David dealt with. King David, obviously not King David here in 1 Samuel 16. He's just David, the son of Jesse. And David started off at, at a disadvantage. You know, they, of course, the, the elder received all of the privileges. The elder received all of the rights. And the youngest was basically given the menial task and, and was not looked up to and was not respected and had, had basically a, a, a zero pull of influence or authority. And David started off his life that way where he was looked down upon, if you will, repeatedly. I want you to look at 1 Samuel chapter number 16. Look at verse number 5. This is when uh, Samuel's actually coming to anoint uh, one of Jesse's children. It says in verse 5, And he said, Peaceably I come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab, that's the eldest, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. So ten of them so far. Now keep reading, verse 11. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Now I want you to notice that when Jesse comes, I'm sorry, when Samuel comes to Jesse, when Je and Jesse is, he is privy to what is about to happen, Jesse goes and gets his sons and prepares his sons that he thinks are a contender for this position, that he thinks could be, you know, possibly anointed. And he chooses out first, starting at the eldest, his first oldest three sons, of course. Eliab, Abinadab, and Shema. Then he goes and gets the next ten youngest, and he brings them. And he's basically like, stands there before uh, 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 Samuel, and Jesse basically says, well, I guess it's none of my kids. And Samuel has to ask Jesse, is there not you know, any more? Do you have any other kids? And then Jesse's like, well, I have one more. To the point where you can obviously see that that. Jesse does not even consider David for this position, does he? So it kind of gives you an idea of David's treatment in his family. Not to say that his dad treated him poorly. Not to say that his dad, you know, uh, in the sense was uh, mean to him or cruel to him. But did Jesse expect David to do anything big for God in his life? No, he did not. David was the youngest of all of them. Of course, you know, no one would have expected of the tribe of Jesse either. David did not expect that. He kind of makes a statement like that to Saul later on. But Jesse, the, Jesse was extremely surprised and he least expected David to be the one to be chosen. Almost to the point where it's demeaning and he's looking down upon David and he's saying, I have one other one. And what is he doing? Think about that. He's out there watching the sheep. Notice he's given the menial task while the gathering's going on. He didn't even call his son David out. So you can tell how his life had been going on. And he was basically, you know, uh, the at the very, very bottom of the totem pole. And it would be safe to assume that his life had went on this way up until this point. Well, this continues. Go over to 1 Samuel 17. That's the famous chapter with David and Goliath. You can tell that his brothers treated him the exact same way. When, all, when his brothers went out to fight with Saul and were fighting in the battle against the Philistine, the Philistines, David was the one that stayed home. David wasn't out in the battle. David wasn't out in the fight. David stayed home. Not only did David stay home, but David was the chauffeur or the gopher 
for his brothers. He went and he fetched them food and water while they fought the battle and while they were the victorious soldiers, if you will. Look at 1 Samuel 17, verse 13. This is actually talking about when uh, David shows up, he hears Goliath cursing the Lord, and he begins to speak to other people around and to say, you know, is anybody going to do anything about this? His eldest brother Eliab hears David saying this to this man, and then he responds in verse number 13. He says this, And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. No, I'm sorry. Uh, this actually records uh, some of what I just uh, was explaining to you, how he brings the, the supplies. Look at verse 18. It tells you the supplies that he brings. And carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. So he's going to be a messenger. He's going to be a gopher. He's, a, he's just uh, bringing the supplies. Now I want you to skip down to look at verse number, it's 28. Verse 28. It says this, And Eliab, this is after he heard David speaking about Goliath, he, uh, and Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto, men, unto, unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. I want you to notice how he's talking down to David. You can see how the relationship works. You can see where David is on the totem pole. You can see the life out just at this point of where David is in his life. You know, he's, he's demeaning him. Where did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? You can see that this is obviously a job that David has that Eliab does not. That this is something that his brethren look down upon him for. It's not that important of a job. He, not only that, he doesn't, he, he's not even uh, uh, considering the fact that David could be possibly even one to fight in the battle. He's not even thinking that David himself wants to. He says, you came down here and all of this that you're doing and saying is because you just want to watch the battle. You want to see the battle. Almost like he's this annoying little, you know, teenage, you know, brother or kid, right? The same thing basically ends up happening with Saul. He's mocked and ridiculed and, and made fun of again by Saul. Look at verse 33. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with them, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Then the same thing happens from Goliath. Verse 42, he goes to fight Goliath. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Now, <clears throat> of course David wins the battle. David defeats Goliath and this is you know, where he's victorious over the giant. That story, you know, all of us, I'm sure, are extremely familiar with. And this is, this, you know, a story that we all know very well. I'm sure probably all of the kids here even know this very well. But most people think that at this point is when David's life, you know, just continually goes uphill until he gets at the top of the hill. And then he's just standing there, you know, in all of his glory until the day of his death. But that is actually not true. Starting right now, David, of course receives exaltation. He becomes, you know, basically uh, uh, the captain concurrent with Joab. You know, he's lifted up and he goes out before him and brings him in, it says. He is extreme. He, he, he wins the favor of Saul. He wins the favor of, of, of the people. So there are a lot of positives. But what we oftentimes do is we focus, when we're reading about other people's lives, we focus only on the positives of their life. And when you think of David, you only think of the positives of David's life. But what we do when we're living our own lives is we ignore the positives in our own life and we fixate on the negatives in our own life. And then when we compare the two, we're comparing the negatives of our lives with the positives of their lives. And we're basically doing this and saying, oh, I wish my life could be like David's. Well, starting right now is where you're going to be, you know, uh, I believe, hopefully awoken, awoken to the life that David actually lived because right now is pretty much the beginning of David's problems. So when David's problems and trials and real, I'm talking real tribulation begins in David's life. So I want you to turn now to 1 Samuel chapter number 18. So David of course starts serving Saul and uh, he's, he's serving Saul. He's faithful to Saul. David is a great man. He's known as a man after God's own heart. But very, very soon Saul almost immediately begins to hate David because he envies him. 
And it says there's a certain time when Saul sought after uh, 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 and started trying to kill David from that day forward. Look at verse number 6. I want you to look at verse number 6 with me. This is when Saul actually starts attacking David. This is when he starts actually putting it, in, putting it into action. He starts trying to kill David. Look at verse 6. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women came out of all cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets with joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth and the saying displeased him and he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Now watch verse 9. And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. So this is almost at the very beginning when David begins to serve Saul. If you look at verse number 1, this is when Jonathan and David become best friends and when Jonathan gives him his robe and all of these different types of things, you know, his girdle, and this is when they first meet one another and they become great friends. So almost in the very beginning, David goes out within the first few years, if you will, he goes out and he battles and he's victorious to the point where he wins the favor even more so of the people than Saul was able to. And Saul becomes envious almost immediately, almost right away to where he seeks after. It says, and Saul eyed David from that day and forward. Now you have to keep in mind that this is his Number one, it's his best friend's father because he builds a relationship with Jonathan that, you know, it says surpasses his love for women, surpasses his love for his own soul. He loves Jonathan and Jonathan loves him more than they love anyone. They are best friends more than any friends could be best friends. And so you have to understand that this is his best friend's father. But not only that, it, it, it is his king and it is his captain, even though he's the captain of the host. The, the upper general is Saul. And Saul hates David. And Saul now wants to kill David. He is seeking an opportunity in reality to take David's life because he feels threatened by David. Because Saul, of course, is going downhill in his own sinful life and you normally project problems to other people that you're having on, in your own life. I want you to look at uh, verse number 29. Verse number 29, it says, And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. This is after Saul noticed that Michal, Saul's daughter, began to fall in love with David. This is before David ever even you know, thought of marrying Michal. David ends up marrying Michal. So now, Saul is even closer to him. He is also his father-in-law. He is, so now he is his best friend's father. He is his father-in-law. But furthermore, he is his king and he is his captain. He is someone that he had spent time with previous. He would come there and play for him on the harp to soothe Saul when God had spent, sent an evil spirit upon him. David had an extremely close relationship with Saul. David was very close with Saul on many levels and from different angles and relationships that he had. So we have to understand exactly how dr dramatic this is when Saul is attempting to kill him. Look now with me at chapter number 19. Look at verse number 1. And David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan. This is after David, or he had already attempted to try to uh, uh, kill him. W where did we read previous? Hold on one second. So we were in chapter number 18. That's correct. We read verse 29. Did we read that? We did read verse number 29. Okay, yeah, look at chapter number 19. I'm sorry, I, st I turned over to chapter 20. That was my problem. So chapter number 19, verse 1. And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. That's what I was looking for. So now notice that Saul is, is wanting... This is actually where he actually says for the first time that he is going to take David's life. He's going to kill him. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning and abide in a secret place place and hide thyself. Excuse me. Look at verse number 10. <clears throat> and Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. Sometimes we read these stories like a cartoon, but this is his father-in-law. This is his best friend's father. It is his captain. It is his king. It's someone that he loved. It would be like your father-in-law trying to kill you. It would be like you grew a very close relationship with someone. You loved them. 
And then they turned on you when you weren't even aware of it. They turned on you and wanted to take, they hated, they became to the point where they're so bitter with you and they hated you, a person that you loved more than, you know, many, many people in, in, in the world. And they hated you so much that now they were trying to kill you. Someone that you loved and cared for. He, he's trying to take his life now. Look at verse number, keep reading actually, verse number 11. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. So he's, he's daily trying to send people after David to take David's life. He's got messengers. He's communicating back and forth with Saul. He's trying to conspire to kill David and to truly take his life. It says, And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed, and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster, and covered it with a cloth. Verse 14. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed. So he's saying, Bring him up to me even in the bed still. I don't care. And then he says this. That I may, where was I at? I lost my spot. Verse number, does anybody know where I was? That I may slay him. Verse 16 now. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. So they go in and they uncover the bed and they see that David's not there, that they had set up a distraction, you know, a decoy, and David is gone. Then... It says this in verse 17, Saul said unto Michal, Why hast thou deceived me so and sent away mine enemy that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul, he said unto me, and Michal answered Saul, he said unto me, let me go, why should I kill thee? Now that's a lie. You know, of course his, she's lying for him because she wanted to save his life. Can you imagine your, your own wife having to, to you know, set up a goat's hair and all of these things because your father-in-law is trying to take your life. Because your father-in-law is coming and trying to kill you. And you're having to leave your family, you're having to leave your wife in the middle of the night and crawl out a window because your father-in-law is trying to take your life and trying to kill you. So he's trying to arrest him there, bring him and capture him so he can bring him and, and kill him. Look at chapter 20 verse 1. This is where uh, I had accidentally turned a moment ago. Next chapter over, chapter 20, verse 1. And David fled Naoth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is mine iniquity and what is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? And he said unto him, God forbid thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me. And what should my father hide this thing? And why should thy, my father hide this thing from me? Uh, it is not so. You know, and then they go on and they make this, this uh, the promise between one another. David makes the statement, the famous statement at the end of verse 3, there is but a step between me and death. So David understands that I am, he says, what he means is I am just one step away from death. That I'm having to watch my back everywhere I go. I'm having to be careful every day. He's sending messengers to my house. He's throwing javelins at me. You know, and he's the king, obviously. He, this is a monarchy, and he makes the decisions, and no one can rein him in or tame him. No one's able to do anything. You know, he is ruling at this point over the kingdom, and no one can say anything. He can, if he wants to kill David, he could kill David, and no one's going to stop him. And that's what's going on. That's what he means. There's, a, there's but a step between me and death. He's saying, I am just one step. Making the wrong step, one wrong step, I could be killed. You know, Choosing to go home tonight, I could lose my life. That's where David was in his life. So we, we, we see already that David is, is fearful and is thinking that he is one step away. He's one moment away from death. Can you imagine living like that yourself? You are literally every day someone seeking your life, really, and looking to kill you. Many people have went through this with the government. This happens all the time. This is, you know, and David was going through this himself. Can you imagine that? That is not pleasant. That is not just... You know, just, just a joyful, peaceful life. He's constantly living in fear that his own father-in-law is going to kill him. To the point where out of David's own mouth, he says, there's just one step between me and death. That's how David feels. Look at, uh, I want you to look with me now at uh, verse 27. Same chapter, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet neither yesterday nor today? So David didn't go eat during uh, the, the feast. 
And it says this, And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, Let me go, I pray thee, for my family hath a sacrifice in the city. And my brother, he hath commanded me to be there. And now, if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away and pray thee and see my brethren. Therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. Now I want to, this is just a side note, but we, first time we've read this verse since the, you know, the start of the church. I want to explain verse number 30 because there's a weird thing, super weird teaching out there that tries to teach that Jonathan and David were homosexuals. And homosexuals are the ones that try to teach this. People that are perverted and they, they spend too much time watching Hollywood movies and just they, their minds have been warped are those that would read these verses and think that that's what this means. So, the, the statement that they'll try to use is when, it's, when he says, Do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion. Like saying that he has chosen him to his own confusion in the, in the sense that it's confusion with man and woman. Or man and man, I'm sorry, as opposed to man and woman. Like that's his own confusion. But he also says this, And unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. Now would that make sense? Of course not. So now he's saying you chose it to the confusion of your mother's nakedness. Now... That wouldn't make sense because that would be man and woman there. So that you couldn't use that. But it actually explains it for you because the word, people ignore this, but the word for in the Bible means because. He explains to you what he means by this. Now, what is the confusion? He's saying that Jonathan is confused. Jonathan is making a bad decision and he's confused and un doesn't understand the repercussions of his decision to choose to protect David in this situation. And he tells you the reason why. Because, look, look at verse 31, because... As long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. So what he's actually saying, and the reason why he says, thy mother's nakedness is this. Do you know what happened when a king, you know, uh, one king died and the next king took his place? Oftentimes that, that king, oftentimes, excuse me, that king would take on the wives of the previous king. You know, this is what Absalom does to David later on. That's why he, you know, uh, uh, he says that he chose it under the confusion of his mother's nakedness. That's why that's mentioned. But then he says, he says it about Jonathan to your own confusion because Jonathan's king, Jonathan is next in line. Jonathan is next in line to become king and he's saying you've chosen him to your own confusion. Why? For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established. He's saying, you're confused by trying to help Jesse in this situation and not for me to kill him because you, need, you don't understand, obviously, that as long as he lives, you're not going to be the king. That's why he's saying he's confused. As long as, he says, for as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. So he's saying, you're confused by saying that you don't want me to kill him because that's stupid of you because if I don't kill him, then he's going to reign after me and you will not be able to reign. That's what the point is there. And then he says, the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. He's talking about how if David were to become king, he would, he would become, you know, uh, he would take on, it's probable that he would take on that wife. Kings did those types of things. It's not good, but that's, it's actually... Uh, an occurrence in the Bible. So here, notice he's still trying to kill him. He's seeking after him. Verse 33, Saul casts a javelin now at Jonathan and tries to kill Jonathan. Well, Jonathan goes back and tells David, you were right. You can't come back. They had a sign that he's going to shoot an arrow. If the arrow was in front of where David was, he knew where David was located and hiding. If the arrow landed in front of him, that means, hey, you're good. You can stay in the kingdom. But if the Pharaoh goes beyond thee, and he's going to tell his, his, uh, the, the bearer of his arrows, I can't remember exactly what his name is given, but he tells him, you know, it's beyond thee when the, when the man is looking for it, that means you're going to have to leave. You're going to have to go, you know, away. That's why it's the beyond. So that's what ends up happening. He communicates to him and he tells him, yes, my father's trying to kill you. David ends up having to leave his native home. He ends up having to leave his house, his family, and he runs from Saul because he's running for his life. This has happened. All of this began instantly after David killed Goliath. A few years after all of this started, almost immediately. Now I want you to look with me, chapter 21, verse 12. I want you to notice that he's, he is in perpetual fear because when he ran, 
Saul followed him, and Saul continued to follow him and continued to try to kill him. Look at verse 12. And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? And, you know, and then he goes on to say, If I need, have need of a madman, you know, that he should you know, come and uh, you know, play in my presence or something along those lines. So... He's actually going to a foreign country where was his enemies, where Goliath li lived. And he goes in and once he gets there, he realizes that the people are talking and they say, you know, isn't this he that they said Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands? This is our biggest enemy and he's coming here. And then David becomes fearful. So when he's brought before Achish, the king of the Philistines, he begins to act like he's a crazy person. This is David. You have to think, why is he doing it? Because he's afraid all of a sudden. He's scared that he's going to lose his life and that Achish is going to kill him. This is the life of David. We're talking about King David, right? That we normally vision, envision him in his glory. He's scrabbling at the door. He's causing spit to fall upon his beard. And he's acting like he's a madman, like he's crazy, because he's so afraid that the king of the Philistines is going to take his life after he had just ran from his father-in-law trying to kill him. And his best friend's father. And if you would have read the story with him and Jonathan, he's there weeping and crying. He's in great agony and grief. And then he has to leave his home, leave his wife, leave, I can't remember if he has children at that time, leave possibly his children, leave his, his, his family as far as his father, his mother, his brethren, and just run away. And he takes a few people with him at this point. And then he gets to where he's, he's going to be going and trying to find somewhere to stay. And they, they instill fear in his heart to the point where he acts like he's crazy so they won't kill him. And then he leaves there. Look at verse 22. Or, I'm sorry, chapter 22, verse 1. And David therefore departed thence and escaped, look at this, to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Do you know where he went? He went to, to live in a cave. King David went and lived in a cave, the cave Adullam. And he was there long enough to where the message got back to his parents, to where his parents had to come and see him there. He's there for months, obviously. Possibly years. Look at, uh, we're just going to keep going through here the, the, the timeline. We're looking at the big picture of the life of David. Look at chapter 23 now. So not only was David in fear, why is he, you know, uh, is, he, is he hiding there? He's in a cave because he's afraid there's nowhere else he can go. But his whole, everyone that came with him, the army that's there with him is actually afraid. Look at verse 3 in chapter 23. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? So they're constantly, they are every day, day after day, living in fear. That somebody's going to come and wipe them out. That somebody's going to come and kill them. Saul has been seeking his life for years on end. While they're hiding and you have the armies, he's just every day trying to come and kill him. Look at uh, uh, same chapter, it's verse 8. Verse 8, And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah. This is war against David. To besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant, hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Listen to him. Will they give me up into his hand? He's praying to God. Why? Because he's fearful. Because he's afraid. He's living in constant fear. And he says, Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. He's begging him. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Keep reading there. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. Look at that. And went whithersoever they could go. You know what they're doing? They're wandering about. That's what they're doing. Just wandering about in their lives. Living in caves and dens and rocks of the earth. Look at, verse, uh, look at the end of the verse. It says, And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbear to go forth. Verse, verse 14, And David abode in the wilderness and strongholds, now watch this, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And look at what it says next, And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. Every day. Living in constant fear, 
constant terror that they're going to lose their lives every day. Look at look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 24. Look at verse 1 and 2. It says, And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Saul had to return for a period of time because the, he had heard that the Philistines attacked Israel. But as soon as that was all finished and done, he came back. He heard that David was, look at this, in the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul went and fought a war and everything. David's still dwelling in the wilderness and living out in the wilderness. In the desert is what that means. Verse 2, Then Saul took 300 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. So he's literally living in mountains and dens and caves of the earth for years and years and years. Look at, we're in chapter 25, look at chapter 20, uh, we're in chapter 24, look at chapter 26. I'm sorry, skip one chapter. Look at chapter 26. Chapter 26, verses 1 through 3. And the Ziphites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hakalah? Where's he at? He's still the same place. Uh, he may have changed, you know, uh, mountains, but he's in the mountains, he's in the wilderness, he's hiding which is before Jeshimon. Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. Go to chapter 27, verse 1. And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. So this, he's basically to the point now, because remember what happened the last time he went to the Philistines. He got scared, act like a madman, thought he was going to die. So at this point he said, I am going to, if I stay here, this is what he's saying. It's basically the exact same logic that was used by the leprous men that were outside of the gates, uh, outside of the camp. They said, if we stay here we die, or if we go there we die. So let's just go ahead and go there. So basically what he's saying is, if I stay here, I'm for sure going to die. There's a chance I could die there, but I might as well try to live and I could at least go into the land of the enemy and hide in the, Philist the land of the Philistines. So, and Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any of the coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. Look at, so that's chapter 27, look at chapter 30. Verse 1, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south. So while all this is going on, Saul's trying to kill him. He's living with the Philistines for a period of time. He earns some favor with them and they, he gets ready to fight in the battle with them and he doesn't because the men become you know, uh, 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 dis disturbed with him fighting alongside of them and he'll fall out and get on the side of. This is like a plan they're, they're basically saying. This happens during all of that period of time. While Saul's still trying to kill him, he's hiding out in the land of the enemy in the Philistines. It tells you that they were attacked and, and, uh, and Ziklag, where his family, his wives, and his children are located. They were smitten, and it says, and burned it with fire. Verse 2, and had taken the women captive. So his wife has been kidnapped now. It says, and, and, and that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. You read over that sometimes. But he comes back to his camp, he comes back home, and the house is burned down, basically. Pretty much, in other words. And his wife is missing and has been taken captive. He has no idea exactly what has happened to her. And also all of his children are gone. His sons and his daughters and all of the wives are gone. And then it tells you in verse 4, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept. And look at this. Until they had no more power to weep. So they cried continually to the point where they were literally, you know, they were physically too weak to cry any longer. While he's constantly living in fear, this is just right on top of it. This is just added to all of his other problems and all of his other trials and all of his tribulations. Now when you think of David, is this how you remember the majority of his life going? This isn't what you think of. You think of David and Goliath. You think of David as the king. You think of David reigning in his glory and being victorious. So this went on, and if you actually try to scale out the life of Saul, Saul dies immediately after this. And when David became uh, uh, the, the servant of Saul, that happened in the first few years of Saul reigning. 
Because Saul, after one year, went and turned uh, and, uh, uh, and, and offered the sacrifice. That was only after he was reigning for one year. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, but he reigned for one year, and that's when Samuel comes to him, and he, was, he wasn't supposed to offer the offering. He was supposed to wait for Samuel, and he didn't wait, and then that's when Samuel tells him, you're not going to be king any longer. Immediately after that, he goes and he anoints David. He anoints David, and then almost immediately after that, he's still a lad. He's still a child. He's still probably a teenager, 17, 18, maybe 19 years old. That's when he defeats Goliath. He's brought into the house of Saul, and he becomes the captain of his host. He marries Michal, and within just a few years, he's ran out of the house. Just a few years, he's out in the wilderness. Let me remind you that Saul reigned for 40 years. So you know what that means? David was probably in the wilderness for 20, probably even 30 years running from Saul. I don't know if you've ever sat and thought about that, but that is, when you look at David's life, it was probably, it was at least 20 years. It would make sense that it's 30, 30 years. That he was, and he could have been there for about five years, if you will. And then after that, he was, run, he was ran out. 20 years running in the wilderness with no certain dwelling place. You know, you know he's, he's living in dens and rocks. He's living in mountains. He's constantly living in fear. His whole entire life. 20 years of his life. Then, it doesn't get any better. Saul dies and David becomes king. David becomes king and go to 2 Samuel chapter number 12. Go to 2 Samuel chapter number 12. David becomes king and, uh, you know, he, it, some of his great feats, you know, uh, you know a, a lot of the problems and trials are behind him. He has a lot of great accomplishments, a lot of good and great things that he does for a period of time. But then one thing that we remember David by is his grievous sin that he committed with Bathsheba. The adultery and, of course, the murder of Uriah. Right? This is a major thing in his life as well. A major problem. And this is something, a sin. It's not just a trial and tribulation or persecution because of himself. But it's still a major thing that happened in his life. The infidelity with Bathsheba. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 is when Nathan comes and withstood him to the face and rebukes him. And then what happens right after that is, after he had committed this, this, this grievous sin, Nathan rebukes him. He acknowledges his sin. And you know, he, he, he repents of it. Then Nathan pronounces the judgment. He says, you're not going to die, but the child's going to die. So then he has, he has this, this baby that ends up dying. He, of course, you know, uh, uh, cries and weeps over it and, and beseeches and prays to God for the baby to live, for the child to live, but the child dies. You know, uh, the, 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 the child passes away, which is horrible. You read about other people's lives sometimes, you don't put yourself in their shoes. That's a, that's a major deal. That's a real big deal. He lost the child, he lost the baby. Then, the very next chapter, chapter number 13, David's daughter is raped. David's daughter Tamar is raped. Look at verse number 10. Chapter number 13, verse number 10. 2 Samuel, we're in. Chapter number 13, look at verse number 10. The Bible says this, And Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber that I might eat of thy hand. Thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come, lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Howbeit he would not hearken under her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. That means that he raped her. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. And she said unto him, There is no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou, hast, that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. Then he called his servant that ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. She's obviously trying to, to by force, make sure that she stays. And this man has to come and drag her literally out. And then it says, 
And she had a garment of divers colors upon her, for with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her, and Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of divers colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went out crying. And Absalom her brother said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. This is David's daughter was raped. But not only was his daughter raped, it was she was raped by his own son. Now, I mean, can you imagine something like that taking place in your own family? Can you imagine something like that today going on in your own household and your own family? His daughter ended up being desolate and secluded in her own house, never spoke to anyone, or in Absalom's house, I'm sorry, never spoke to anyone and stayed by herself, depressed, and it ruined her entire life. Well, it gets worse. Then, Absalom, which he, this man deserves death, but he goes and Absalom plans this plot where he invites Amnon to a dinner. The man Amnon, who is Absalom's brother, of course, who raped you know, it's Absalom's sister and Amnon's sister. They're all children of David. They sit down to eat, and Absalom has a plan where he has Amnon killed. So Amnon is put to death. Amnon's killed by the hands, basically, of, of Absalom. Absalom has him put to death. So now he's got a daughter that's desolate and raped, that's lived, that you know, is living in Absalom's house. Absalom killed the other brother, he was and, and she was raped by her own brother, and then Absalom murders him. Okay? Flip over just two chapters. And in chapter number 14, you know, he tries to get Absalom to come back. Chapter number 15, just two chapters over, chapter number 15, now Absalom, that same son, begins to conspire against his own father. He begins to conspire against his own father, David, where he is going to steal the kingdom. And he actually steals it. It tells you that he stole the hearts of all the people. You know, he stood at the gate, the door of the gate, and he said, oh, that the king would deputy, uh, deputy a man, you know, for all of your things. They basically tell him to fix all your problems, what all politicians try to say. We're going to make everything perfect and everything, you know, good. You know, if, if it was me, I'd do it. And what do they do? Yeah, you forget about this. You think, oh, everybody loved David. He had the favor of everyone. No, everyone chose Absalom and not David. And they didn't want David reigning over them anymore. And he was successful. He stole, the Bible says, the hearts of all of the nation of Israel. Everyone went after, went after Absalom. All of them. Uh, you know, he, uh, Ahithophel was one of his counselors. Went after him. Just, you know, pretty much all of his right-hand man. So people left with him. Joab went with him. The captain of the host was left with David. So he kept some close people, but he lost a lot of people. And David ended up having to flee for his own life from his own son who stole the kingdom from him. He left his wives behind him and, and, and left them there in the, in the kingdom. And Absalom uh, uh, laid with all of David's wives, all of his own father's wives, and set up a tent and, and meant to be, you know, it meant to be him asserting his authority like I'm the king now. And basically mocking and humiliating his father. Slept with all of David's wives with a tent set up to where everyone in the whole nation of Israel was able to see the tent. He set it in a spot in the palace where everyone could see it. Just meant to humiliate and mock David while David's on the run and David's worried that his own son is going to try to kill him and take his own life. I want you to go to... So we're in chapter 15 now. Flip over to chapter 16. Chapter 16, we'll see some of this taking place. Look at verse 5. It says, And when David came to Behurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. So this is when David's fleeing, and this man comes out. It says, He came forth and cursed still as he came. That means still as he came. That's saying, this is the Bible's language for sometimes you may not understand it. It's while he's walking, he's cursing. He said he cursed still as he came. It's saying while he's walking during the... He didn't walk and then stop and curse. While he's walking, he's just cursing as he's, he's approaching David. That's what that means. And then it says this, and he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, come out, come out thou bloody man and thou man of Belial. So he's calling him a man of the devil. 
That's what he's saying. And he's being cursed. There's all these people around. And he's walking and he's throwing stones. Just throwing all these stones at David and mocking David. Calling him a son of the devil. While they're just, they, they, they don't stop. You know, of course, you know, uh, uh, his, some of his soldiers, the sons of, Ab I can't remember who it is. I believe it's the son of Zeruiah. Some of the sons of Zeruiah. Abishai or something. Brother Hall's looking at it right now. He can tell me. But it's, some of them, they say something to him and he's like, you know, you know allow him. God has allowed him, Right? You know, they say something about Shimei being like a dog's head or something. They just allow it. They put up with it. And David just keeps going while he's mocking him. He's cursing him. He's saying, you know, you should go to hell. Whatever type of curse that it is. You want something bad to happen to him? David was the king just hours before this. And he's just throwing stones at him in front of everyone while he's walking away. Throwing them at all of his men while they're just traveling along. Now, is this how you thought of the life of David? This is the big picture of the life of David. This is how David's life went. The majority, the vast majority of David's life was trouble and trials. Serious troubles and trials and persecutions and tribulations and problem after problem after problem. Look with me at... Look with me at... Uh, second. So we're at 2 Samuel chapter 16... Verse 5. Well, I don't have the other verses pasted, but... So Absalom ends up stealing the kingdom. Absalom takes the kingdom. Of course, David, you know, uh, David runs. He's, of course, trying to kill him. He doesn't. But Absalom ends up being killed as well. So, I mean, it, it's not over yet. Absalom ends up dying by, at the hands of Joab, who is his captain, who's basically his right-hand man. He's the captain of the host. When he specifically instructed him not to kill his son. And he killed his son anyways. And David is just crying and mourning. you got to remember, David also lost the life of his best friend, Jonathan. And the life of his father-in-law. And David did not have a wicked heart. He mourned for Saul and Jonathan bitterly. And he bitterly mourned for his son. It's just problem and trial after trial after trial in David's life. And you have not only that, his own nephews. They end up killing, I don't know if you have noticed this in the genealogies, but does everyone remember Amasa, who ends up being, who replaces during the, the rebellion, who basically replaces Joab for a period of time? Well, when Joab comes back with David, Joab takes Amasa aside and he sticks, you know, him, to use some, you know, uh, gangster talk there, sticks him with a knife and kills him. You know, art thou in health, my brother? And he grabs him by the beard and stabs him. I don't know if you know this, but Amasa is David's nephew also. Uh, um, Zeruiah and Abigail are David's sisters. The sons of Zeruiah are Abishai, uh, Asahel, and Joab. The son of Abigail is Amasa. So what happened there was one of his nephews killed his other nephew and stabbed him in the stomach and said, Art thou in health, my brother? It's because Amasa was, you know, he was a threat to him. He was the captain of the host under Absalom. Joab comes back. And Joab's, I'm sure, concerned that Amasa is going to still be the captain of the host or, you know, he's a threat to him. So he just goes and he kills him, stabs him in the stomach and kills him. And, and then just like kicks him to the side while all the troops continue to go wide. He wallows in his own blood and dies a gruesome death there. So then he has one of his nephews kill his other nephew after his son had just died by his, the hands of his nephew. So Joab is not just the captain of his host, it's his nephew who killed his own son, who killed... David's own son. And then David mourns bitterly about this. You know, David's life was a life of trials and tribulations like almost nobody else in the Bible, really, when you really study it. Do you know what happened time after time in David's life? The same occurrence specifically was betrayals. He's betrayed by Saul. He's, you know, betrayed by Doag the Edomite, you could even say. He's betrayed by Absalom. He's, I mean, you could go on and on. He's betrayed by Joab numerous times. He's betrayed by uh, just numerous, over and over and over again he's betrayed. Just repeatedly. His life is just a life of being betrayed by people that he's very close with. People that he's very, very close to just time after time. When David's on his deathbed, when David's on his deathbed, his own son tries to betray him. Adonijah tries to take the kingdom from David, while David is still even alive, as opposed to, and, and through deceit and lies and a wicked heart, tries to steal the kingdom while David is literally dying. David lived a long life. 
And David, go back to Romans chapter 8. And David had a lot of, of, of blessings in his life. But David had a lot, a lot of heartache. He had a lot of problems in his life. And what you need to understand is that they're not going to go away. And we can relate this on a personal level. We can relate this on a family level. And, and, and even more relevant lately, we can relate this on a church level. We need to understand that it's going to be hard to grow the church. There's going to be fightings. There's going to be problems. There's going to be issues. There's going to be you know, great people within the church that are going to hurt you and do bad to you and stab you in the back and betray you. And I don't know if everyone remembers before we had ever had issues with this. I actually said this multiple times in the first eight, nine months of the church. Multiple times I, I made this warning. Now it's got a little bit more flesh on it. Now it's a little bit more understanding because you think sometimes that'll never happen to me, but then it happens. It is going to be difficult to grow the church and to, and to, to build something here for God. It's going to be very difficult. It's going to be hard to, you know, to continue to endure when it's one problem after the next, after the next, after the next. But you know what you can do is you can look at the lives of the people in the Bible and you can find comfort in the life of David. Because before this you probably would have thought, David can't relate to my problems. David had a lot bigger problems than you did. Right. And you know what David did? David ran the race that was set before him patiently. Amen. And you know where he ended up? In the kingdom. Amen. After all the trouble and the problems that he had, and, he, and, and oftentimes you don't think about this, but in Hebrews chapter number 11, when it's talking about the men of faith that were wandering about in sheepskins and goatskins and dens and rocks and wilderness, that's King David! And you think, oh, that's not King David. King David's life wasn't like that. King David's life was like that for probably 20 years, 30 years. Think about that. 20 or 30 years, that's what he went through. It's like, man, two years into this thing, is it ever going to grow? Is the church ever going to grow? Are the problems ever going to stop? You know, this sure doesn't look like a den in the side of, you know, En Gedi, in the wilderness of En Gedi. Right. You know, we're blessed beyond measure and we oftentimes don't understand how blessed we are to have the people that we have here. And to have the people that are, that are remaining faithful and wanting to serve God and can be a blessing and an encouragement to us. You overlook those types of things and you look at other people's lives. You magnify the negatives in your own life and then you look at everybody else's life and everything's greener on the other side. The grass is always greener on the other side. And you say, look at all the positives of their life. I wish I could live the life of David. Are you sure about that? Because you always, there are what's, it, they're growing pains. In order to, to do something great for God, David did magnificent things for God. Great, amazing things for God. But it, they equal out. He also had horrible things happen to him in his life. In a very extreme way. Severities of, of just disasters. Horrible things that happened. Things that I would never wish upon anyone. He went through those. And really, day after day, had to wake up with a broken heart thinking about all of the terrible things that's going on in his life. It, you know, seeking his life daily in fear. It's comforting to know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are the called according to his purpose. But I want you to look at this, and this is a, 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 a verse that I like to think about a lot. When I was growing up, my pastor used to quote this verse constantly. Verse number 18 is actually where that whole context begins. So I told you I was going to be, in, I wanted to begin in 28, but I want to back up. Because like I said, this whole passage is about sufferings. And he says this in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That is a powerful verse. That is an extremely powerful verse. He's saying that the sufferings of this present time, the problems, the trials, the tribulations that we go through in this present time, he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, he says this, are not worthy to be compared. They're not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. He's talking about, if you were to try to measure on 1 to 10, 10 being the worst problems and the sufferings that you went through over here, and you put a number on that, but then you try to measure over here the glory that you shall reveal that, that sh you shall receive or shall be revealed in you. So you can't even compare the two. This one is just so off the charts, it's ridiculous. It's like trying to compare 
infinity to something that's finite. Something that is that is that continues to go. He said it's not even worthy to com be compared with one another. They're not even they're, they're not even in the same league. That's what he's trying to say. He's, he wants you to understand that you go through these problems, these trials, and these tribulations, and you think your life is over and it can't be any worse than this. But he says that how great, how big a problem you're going through today isn't even worthy to be compared with how great of glory you're going to receive later. It's almost like when people try to like compare McDonald's and Chick-fil-A, right? They're not even worthy to be compared with one another, right? You know, it's, it, 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 you know on a serious note, the problems, it's, this is what he's saying, it's ridiculous to try to even act like that the sufferings that you are going through in this present life can compare unto how great you're going to be repaid later. Because he goes into, in verse number 32, a lot of people have trouble tying context together. He says this, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So then afterwards, he talks about how you're going to be rewarded after this whole string of thought is being summarized of all the problems, the infirmities, how you're groaning, you're going through issues, you're going through tribulations and trials and persecutions. And then he says he's going to freely give us all things. How can you even compare the stupid little problems that you have in this life? Even the problems and the sufferings that David went through aren't compared to the glory that he has now. It's a, this is the point. It's, it's heaven... And the glory of the moment when you see Jesus, the moment when you're there with all the saints, the moment that you finally get to paradise and you take, take that first step into Beulah land, so it's not even compared to the problems you have now. Amen. You can't even compare the two. He's saying it's laughable or it's ridiculous. So, a couple of, of ending thoughts. Number one, what should you do? You should look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. When you're having these problems, you're having these trials, look to him as an example. Look to him as someone who went through these trials and tribulations and problems, but also look to Jesus. Look to that moment when you finally get to see Jesus. You finally get to, you know, look at Jesus. When it's all worth it. It's all finally worth it when you finally get to heaven. That can be your biggest motivator to get through all the, the trials and tribulations. And when you feel like giving up and you feel like everything's going wrong, you know, look at the life of some of the other men in the Bible. Look at the life of David. Was he in God's will? Of course he was. God's answering him. God's giving him direction while he's there. God wanted him in the wilderness for 20 to 30 years. God may want this church not to grow that fast. God may want this church to, you know... Struggle for a, a period of time. You know what that did for David was that kept David humble, I'm sure. Amen. Sleeping in a cave. Fearing for your life every day. Running for your life. Having just problem after problem. You know what it does is it keeps you humble. It keeps you humble. So don't assume, oh, we, you know, why is this happening to me? We must not be in God's will. You must not be reading the Bible. You must not be closely reading what's going on in these people's lives because oftentimes the sufferings that they go through are much worse than what you're going through. But even still, the worst sufferings, of the worst that you can compare, or the worst that you could come up with and that you could generate in your mind, the things David went through, that's the best, I, the best thing to end this whole sermon on. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be in us. You know, just for that, it's worth it. Just for that, it's worth it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for, for uh, sharing your glory with us. We thank you for what you went through so that you could do that. Uh, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. Keep us humble, dear Lord God. Uh, we ask you that you would uh, build the church in your time and that uh, uh, it would be built a strong house, not fast and loose with bricks, you know, uh, being broken and, and problems here and there in the house, but that you would build it and that you would build it slow and that we would have a keep a humble heart, dear God, and that we could be uh, uh, that much greater and stronger of a church in the end. Thank you for the great example of David, dear Lord, and, and just recording all of this. Help us to have a, 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 a um, help us to see the big picture. Help us not to just fixate on our own problems and to look at other people's lives and to look at only the positive, but help us to see the big picture. And uh, 
Uh, even tying in with that, help us to see the big picture of, of the glory that we will receive, even though we will go through the sufferings and the trials. Help us to endure and guide us with your spirit, dear Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.